Good evening, I'm Bhuvne Shuri. On behalf of Forbes, I welcome you all for the scientific webinar series, Why is an RV practice during COVID-19? We, Forbes, as an organization, always believe and serve with the tagline, innovating for good health, and has given innovative product formulas to the mankind, like El Montes, the pioneer and the best brand of levocitrazine and Montelukast, and Palmoclear, a novel combination of acibrophilin and N-acetylcysteine. It is our pride privilege to associate with Indian Academy of Otorhino Laryngology Head and Neck Surgery in their fourth webinar series. I would like to thank Dr. Vijay Krishnan, Secretary of Indian Academy, for giving us this opportunity to be associated with. For now, I welcome all the eminent speakers and participants to this virtual meeting and I hand over the session to Dr. Mohan Kameshwaran for further proceedings. Thank you, Ms. Bhuvaneshwari, uh, and uh, welcome uh, all of you. Welcome to the the fourth uh, in the series of uh, webinars, which is being organized with the Indian Academy of Otorhinolaryngology and Head Neck Surgery. The, the previous three uh, webinars have been resounding success. And I'm sure this is going to be on the same footing. It's a very important topic that has been chosen today. Uh, the care of the voice as well as the airway practice during this all of us are only too uh, aware of the, the very high risk involved with uh, the airway practice as well as uh, the care of the voice during this period. And we have experts today uh, to tell us and guide us about the procedures and about the practice that they are adapting in their own clinics. So we have a very eminent faculty today. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Dinesh Chetri from UCLA uh, and we have uh, Dr. Anastasios, uh, from uh, Abu Dhabi, from the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, we have a chairman of the Indian Academy, uh, the, the president of the Indian Academy of Water Technology and Neck Surgery, uh, Dr. K.K. Handa, uh, who has been uh, responsible for keeping the voice of most of the politicians happening in Delhi. Uh, and he's going to be talking about the kind of the voice, uh, his experience. Uh, and we also have a, a, a panel uh, from this, uh, part of the following this talk. This panel is a very high-powered panel uh, with very eminent panelists. Uh, apart from the three that I mentioned, we're going to be having also uh, Dr. Uh, Tirna Karsu from who's a, a pediatric otorhinologist uh, in Chennai, based out of Chennai, uh, in the Anj Kamakuri Hospital. So we have uh, Dr. Amita Broy Chaudhary, a very well-known uh, otorhinologist from uh, Kolkata. Uh, we have Dr. An Sharma from Gurugram and also Dr. Gautam Paul, who's from Gohati. So all of them are going to be uh, you know, telling us about uh, sharing their experience with us. So this is going to be a, an extremely important and I think informative uh, evening for all of us. A special thanks to Ports the Laboratories for uh, sponsoring this event. Uh, you know, we, we really uh, are very appreciative of uh, the support. And we do hope that will continue in the future as well. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to stand uh, in your in way of the uh, proceedings today and uh, I would like to thank all the panelists and the speakers today for sparing their valuable time to be with us. I think it's going to be a very informative evening and we're very, very grateful to all of them for having uh, spared their valuable time. Thank you. I hand over the, uh, the moderation of the uh, evening to our president, uh, A.K. Handa, who will carry on. Thank you, Dr. Mohan, uh, and I welcome all of you, all our esteemed uh, faculty, uh, Dr. Dinesh Chetri from UCLA, Dr. Uh, Tassos from Abu Dhabi Cleveland Clinic, Amit Rao Roy Chaudhary from Kolkata, uh, Dr. Gautam Khan will be joining us, Dr. Anand is there, he's an anesthetist in Vedanta, and Dr. Thiru from Chennai. Uh, now, how we have uh, shape the program in the next two hours is first one hour we will have three uh, talks first talk will be on office based lar laryngeal procedures very relevant and interesting topic it will be done by dr dinesh chetri then i'll be uh, talking on care of professional voice and dr tassos will be talking on managing vocal cords scar and sulci again a very very important problem in laryngology after that, we'll move on to an interactive panel discussion where we will take inputs from all our panelists. And uh, this is regarding the practice of laryngology in COVID times. 
you know, COVID are difficult times. There are question marks about when to start practice, how to start practice, what procedures to do, what sort of PP, uh, in laryngology, where to stop. So th 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 these are all burning questions which affect all of us. So that is how we'll go about it. Now, I invite Dr. Dinesh Chetri for his first talk. This is on office-based procedures on, in laryngology. Dr. Dinesh Chetri, please. Good evening. It's really nice to see everybody. I'm very excited to be here. So just to save time, I'm going to go ahead and share my talk and play. Good evening. I'd like to thank Dr. Honda and the Indian Academy of Otorhinolaryngology for inviting me to give this talk. I'll be talking about office-based laryngology procedures for the next 15 minutes. There has been an evolution of office-based procedures in laryngology. As we know, laryngology started in the office initially, but this was limited because of lack of anesthesia and instrumentation that was limited to a headlight and laryngeal mirror. Laryngology then went to the operating room because of the development of microscopes, rigid Hopkins rod endoscopes, laser, and microinstrumentation. Laryngology is now coming back to the office. Why has this happened? Well, there has been significant technological improvements in video endoscopy, particularly flexible, chip-dip, high-definition transnasal endoscopes. We are now also using new injectables, and we have applications of old medications like steroid for airway disease. There has been development of fiber-based lasers, particularly fiber-based CO2 laser, as well as the pulse dye laser and the KTP laser. We are now doing new things in the office that we didn't do before, like dysphagia evaluation and treatment. And we have now novel techniques to approach the larynx so we can both do diagnostics and therapeutics. What do you gain by office-based procedures? Well, number one, you get savings of time and increased efficiency. You might do a procedure in the operating room for 30 to 60 minutes, and then there's a turnover time of 30 to 60 minutes. Whereas in the office, the procedure might take significantly less time and there is almost no turnover or very small turnover. Repeated procedures are also better done in clinic. You can avoid airway complications. Patients who have been radiated, for example, are very difficult to intubate. And also, the aging population is at risk of anesthetic complications because risk of anesthesia increases with age. For vocal fold procedures, you can monitor the voice quality in the office very well. Also, patients can be brought or drive themselves to and from the office and can even go to work the same day. And so there is overall significant cost savings to doing procedures in the office. There are still some things that I do in the operating room. What do you gain by doing things in the operating room? Well, one is precision. For example, if I'm going to laser the medial surface of the vocal fold for papillomas, it's better done for me, at least in the operating room theater. Intracortal cysts, they need to be done in the operating room. The operating room also has a, a you know, high mag magnification microscopes that gives you true colors and surgical control. For example, doing microsurgery for excision of laryngeal cancer. And finally, you have a lot of help in the operating room theater. You have scrub techs, nursing, and the anesthesiologist. So these are some of the procedures that can be done in the office. In the nasopharynx, we can do endoscopy, biopsy, injections, and dilations. In the oropharynx, we can evaluate for swallowing disorders. We can do biopsies, more injections, and also laser procedures. In the larynx, we have always been doing laryngoscopy and videostroboscopy. Now we can do biopsy of lesions. We inject uh, materials for augmentation of the vocal fold. We can do therapeutic injections with Botox, Cydofovir, steroid, etc. And we also frequently now do office-based laser therapy for papillomas and varices. The esophagus has now been opened up to us because of the development of the transnasal esophagoscope and we can do endoscopy, biopsy, we can do esophageal dilations, injection of Botox to the UES, and even the LES if you so desire. And also, pretty much all of the tracheoesophageal punctures for tracheoesophageal speech 
I am now doing in the office. In trachea, you can do endoscopy for stenosis, you can do biopsy, you can do steroid injection for airway stenosis, you could even do a balloon dilation if you wanted to. This is what I would call my most common and impactful in-office laryngology procedures. Video stroboscopy for voice assessment, uh, endoscopic evaluation of swallowing and transnasal esophagoscopy for dysphagia assessment, and then bronchoscopy for airway assessment. And in terms of therapeutics, frequently we do vocal fold injection augmentation, uh, vocal fold injection with Botox, a KTP laser for papillomas and polyps and Reinke's edema, tracheosophageal puncture, and esophageal dilation. So I'm going to go through a few of the procedures. We don't have that much time, so I'm going to cover about four or five procedures that I do frequently. First is injection augmentation of the vocal fold. So the surgical algorithm for glottic insufficiency for me is if it's an early injury or the patient is not a candidate for the operating room theater, then I will perform a injection laryngoplasty in the office and this can be repeated as often as you like. If it is a late injury or there is no chance of recovery, then we go on to framework surgery in the operating room. The key to injecting the larynx is to understand the anatomy. So I primarily use two techniques, a transmembrane technique and a transcartilaginous technique. In the transmembrane technique, if you can look here, this is the inferior border of the larynx and this is the midline. I just go just underneath the cartilage and about five millimeters laterally and that's the entry point for injection. Whereas in the transcartilaginous injection, you can see this is the anterior commissure where the X is. You want to be below that uh, and it's obviously above the inferior border of the thyroid cartilage and you want to be about five millimeters laterally to do the injection. So I'm going to... The, the pros of doing injections uh, in the office obviously is it's fast, minimal discomfort, no need for laryngeal anesthesia and excellent results of experience. However, there's a small learning curve to do this, do injection augmentation. The injection itself, while viewed on the video monitor, is done by feel, and you can't directly see the needle going into the vocal fold unless you're doing this technique intraorally or transthyrohyoid. Uh, it may be difficult to do these procedures in obese necks, and uh, you need somebody to hold this. For, so for the transmembrane technique, the first, first step is to palpate the anterior laryngeal landmarks, particularly the thyroid and the cricoid cartilage and the cricothyroid membrane. I do inject a small amount of anesthetic to the skin over the cricothyroid membrane when I do injection augmentation. I place my finger over the cricothyroid membrane right at the inferior thyroid ala, and then I insert the needle at the inferior border of the thyroid cartilage to make that needle to, t uh, needle to uh, cartilage contact. As soon as I feel that, you can see my index finger goes over the needle and just pushes that needle just underneath the inferior thyroid cartilage. And it, as soon as you do that, you're actually in the paraglottic space and you are now ready to direct that needle towards where you want to inject. And so you are going to bend that needle towards the paraglottic space, lateral and superior to get that injection just lateral to the vocal process and perhaps slightly anterior and then you inject that while watching on the video monitor. So this is a video of a transmembrane injection. Here I am palpating the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid uh, cartilage. Then my finger goes right on the cricothyroid membrane. After that, I make the needle tip to thyroid cartilage contact. And then as soon as I do that, I just push that needle just under the cartilage and insert maybe a couple of millimeters now I am in the paraglottic space. I can then insert that needle further into the paraglottic space, just superiorly and uh, laterally, and perform the injection while looking at the monitor. And here on the monitor, you can see, this is a patient with uh, left-sided vocal fold paralysis. The uh, vocal process is actually in a good position, so this is an excellent uh, patient for injection augmentation and again the needle is going through the transmembrane technique and you continue to inject until the vocal fold is slightly uh, well medialized. 
For the transcartilaginous technique, the step one and two are the same. You want to palpate the laryngeal landmarks, place the finger at the level of the correct thyroid membrane. However, at this time, you want to insert the needle perpendicular to the thyroid cartilage, slightly above the inferior border. And this, this technique is typically uh, done in younger female patients. In this technique, it's very important to feel the pop through the cartilage when the needle just enters through the cartilage and you're now in the paraglottic space. And as this happens, you want to bend the needle towards the paraglottic space, which is lateral, as you can see. And this is a needle at the end of my injection, how it's bent right at the hub, pointing towards the paraglottic space. So this is a, a video of that technique. I have just gone through the cartilage. I felt it as soon as I feel the pop there. I felt the pop there. Now I can bend the needle and then uh, inject in the, in the paraglottic space. When do you stop the injection? Kind of depends. You know, if you uh, were to inject and make the vocal fold nice and straight, the patient's voice is immediately better. Uh, some people advocate it slightly over injecting. That is fine. And here's a patient who had bilateral vocal cord paralysis with the dysphonia. And, you know, you just inject until there's just the right amount of airway. He does still have uh, enough airway posteriorly that you could do this in the, uh, in the office. So you certainly couldn't do this in the operating room. So the pearls to injection augmentation is to target the paraglottic space and avoid superficial injection while uh, getting adequate medialization. I bend the needle. I feel the inferior border of the thyroid ala with the needle and just slide the needle underneath, then bend the needle up and lateral for the transmembrane, uh, or that's for the transmembrane approach. And then I just feel the needle pop to the cartilage and immediately bend the needle lateral for the transcartilaginous approach. Next, I'm going to talk about percutaneous Botox, Botox injection for spasmodic dysphonia. There are lots of ways to inject. Uh, all are effective. Uh, none have been compared to one compared uh, to another. Uh, it really depends on the comfort and familiarity of the individual uh, physician. I use the percutaneous transcervical technique. Others have used per mucosal transoral technique. Uh, you, you, you want to use the transtracheal or posterior lateral for the abductor injection. Many Many of my colleagues use EMG guidance for injection, but I don't think that's quite necessary, and I do not use EMG guidance for Botox injection. The technique is against this, again the same, uh, either transcartilaginous or transmembrane. Most patients with spasmodic dysphonia that I treat happen to be younger uh, females, and it's quite easy to go to the transcartilaginous technique. The target muscles are thyroarytenoid and lateral cricorytenoid for the uh, adductor spasmodic dysphonia. And you can see that as soon as you enter into the paraglottic space and, and deposit Botox in the paraglottic space, it's going to go to both the lateral cricorytenoid and the thyroid to uh, take its effect. Uh, for abductor, you want to inject the posterior cricorytenoid and you can either go straight through the uh, cricothyroid membrane and then point slightly laterally, then go through the cricoid cartilage to inject the uh, PCA muscle or it can go lateral approach just behind the, uh, the uh, posterior border of the larynx and hit the cricoid cartilage. I happen to use just this straight technique right through the uh, trachea and through the cricoid cartilage. So here's an uh, example of percutaneous Botox so injection for right adductor here, spasmodic right dysphonia. The technique is same uh, as I used before, needle through the cartilage, transcartilaginous injection. I feel the needle pop through and then inject the material. So, uh, transcartilaginous. Okay, all done. And it's quite, typically I use a low dose, uh, uh, one unit to start for uh, females and 1.5 for males. And obviously, as you know, you need to titrate the dose depending on the outcomes of voice and also to minimize the side effects of long-term breathy dysphonia and dysphagia.
I just want to next go to laryngotracheal anesthesia for laryngotracheal procedures. And it may seem like a simple thing to talk about, but I really think it's important for us to discuss this because once you anesthetize the larynx, you can do so many things to the larynx for office procedures. So lidocaine is your friend for laryngotracheal anesthesia. You can do it many different ways. You can take a channel scope, uh, then use a laryngeal gargle. I give aliquots of half a mil uh, while the patient phonates. A total of three to four cc uh, is needed and takes two to three minutes for the laryngeal gargle to uh, get adequate effect. Now, my most favorite technique is to go transtracheal, again, putting my finger through the cricothyroid membrane. Then I will uh, place a 25 gauge needle through the cricothyroid membrane, uh, pull back on the syringe to see air, and then I will give aliquots of half a cc each as the patient phonates E, and then uh, after about uh, four, four milliliters or so of 4% uh, lidocaine, the larynx is quite ready for uh, airway exam. And this is, an, uh, this is a, the illustration of the needle going through the cricothyroid membrane into the airway. Another technique to not only do injections uh, to the larynx, but also to approach the larynx for injection of cydofovir or, any, uh, or other injectables is to go through the transthyrohyde approach. The figure on the left shows the original study that showed how to do this using a straight needle going just over the thyroid notch and heading straight down and the needle comes down right at the level of the petiole. Subsequently, a modification is made to perform a, a, another 90 degree bend. So you have, you have two bends, one at the hub and one, one about midway through and that seems to make it a little bit easier to access the larynx. So you can use regular flexible, flexible scope without a side channel to do this procedure. I do anesthetize the skin first a little bit. I palpate the thyroid notch. I double bend the needle, insert the needle into skin, and then aim nearly vertically down. The needle stays in place even if the patient swallows. And here's an example of the th transthyrohyoid uh, technique to approach the larynx and also to perform uh, uh, anesthesia. So the needle just went through the thyroid notch. And this is uh, what you want to see. You want to see the needle come right through the uh, uh, petiole. And amazingly, patients tolerate this procedure quite well. Once, you have, once you're there, you're, you can go ahead and uh, inject the anesthetic. Um, and after that, you can actually leave the needle in place and attach a syringe for injection augmentation or for cydofovir, or perhaps if you want to inject Botox this way, you can also do that. So one of the most common reasons to do uh, laryngotracheal anesthesia is to assess airway for tracheal stenosis. I think this is the most effective procedure for preoperative assessment of airway stenosis because you can assess the entire airway. You don't need to get any imaging if you do this. Um, and you can see that on the top here, if a patient comes and has an obvious stenosis, you don't need to do uh, an exam of the, of the airway. But if you can't see it like in the, in the patient below, then you want to get a, a, an assessment before you go to the operating room. Yes, and what are you That's looking great. for? You're mostly looking for uh, the grade of stenosis, the length of stenosis, distance from the vocal cords, quality, for example, is more of a webby kind of stenosis. This is a multi-level stenosis. And I know just by looking at this and the fact that it's webby, this is an excellent candidate for endoscopic procedure. Other times, here, patient came with hemoptysis and has an invasive tumor from the thyroid cartilage. And this is, of course, a time to uh, get a scan of the neck. This is an example of steroid injections for subglottic stenosis in a patient who required frequent dilations. And I have a number of patients that are now managed with uh, regular injections of the subglottis uh, and the steno stenosis area every, every three months or so. You're doing great. You're almost done. She's going to make a little bit of a narrowing right mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. okay, no. okay, that's nice. Okay, so finally I want to talk a little bit about management, management of esophageal stenosis following head and neck hand treatment. Uh, the 
development that allows us to do some of these procedures in the office is the CRE balloon dilator. I use the uh, CRE balloon dilator with the inflation system from Boston Scientific. I like it because it's here very easy to use and it's also a compliant balloon so you're not going to cause too much uh, damage if you ha happen to, to uh, dilate something that is quite snotty. So typically I start with initial esophageal dilations in the operating room and if patients need repeat dilations then I can do this in the office. I will do one to two dilations in the operating room one week apart under general anesthesia and then at that time I'm doing esophagoscopy dilation, application of minomycin C, and this is typically for patients who've had chemoradiation therapy that led to esophageal stenosis. All subsequent dilations, if needed, can, then be, can be done in the operating, can be done in the clinic well, with a CRE balloon. So how to do this? I use the transnasal esophagoscope for direct visualization of the pharyngeal and esophageal stricture. The balloon I even keep from the operating room. I can bring it to my clinic and use that. And the balloon goes through the contralateral nasal cavity and TNE goes through the, the one nasal cavity. And here's an example of a CRE balloon. Uh, I've got the transnasal uh, esophagoscope from the right nostril. The balloon goes to the, uh, the left nostril. And once it just passes the curvature of the nasopharynx, you can uh, uh, observe the tip of the dilator going into the postcoicoid area. You can see this patient has a really swollen uh, larynx and it's a bit challenging to pay, pay, put this patient to sleep, whereas this can be done in several minutes. You want to just see the, the, the base of the balloon when you do balloon dilations um, and you want to uh, not allow the balloon to squish the larynx so much that the patient cannot breathe. This is a pretty good position for this uh, dilation and uh, the outcomes have been quite good based on this. So that's all I have. Thank you very much uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Can you, uh, yeah, we will take questions at the end. Sure. Uh, we'll try to integrate it with the panel. So we'll come to the next, uh, next talk which is on care of professional voice. Is my screen visible? Not yet. Okay. No, my share screen? No, no, no. 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 We'll just wait for a minute. Uh, he will join back, I think. Uh.
Yes. Share your screen, sir. Yeah, we are getting your screen. Audio. Dr. Handa, you are muted. And video is also not on. Okay, now, now it should be okay? Yes. Yes. So, we have two types of uh, professional voice users. There are either presentational users, you have a lot of TV channels, you have radio jockeys, and you have performers. Each one of them is, uh, is a different variety and they have their specific issues. Now, let us understand the voice is not just the vocal cords. There is bellows where the air comes in, the strength comes in. Vocal cords are only the vibrators. Then we have resonators and articulators. All of them are as equally important as the vocal cords. So there are a lot of situations where we have to pay attention. A compromised lung function may be affecting the voice. It may not just be a lesion on the vocal cords. As laryngologists, we have to, those who run the voice clinic, it is not just the laryngologist. You, you have multiple people involved. Probably the most important is the voice therapist. But again, uh, for singers, professional voice users, you may need a voice coach or a singing teacher. At times, we need a physiotherapist, gastroenterologist, pulmonologist, neurologist, psychiatrist, endocrinologist. As the lecture goes along, you'll appreciate why. But even if you don't have them regularly in the clinic, you must have a referral base where with specific problems these patients can be sent. Now, the first important thing is each artist has a different vocal character. There is nothing as a, a perfect voice. Even a hoarse voice may be a singer's, uh, say, his uh, USP or her USP. This singer, Usha Utta, if you see her speaking voice, she's probably hoarse. But a singing voice is uh, it, it's how she sings. And you, you don't try to alter it. So that is true for any professional uh, artist or singer. You understand the character and don't try to alter it. Now, one more important thing is a lot of these artists, they have hypothyroid function. A lot of times when we examine the vocal cords, cords are normal. But if you do T3, T4, TSH, the thyroids may be deranged. Then some who hear less talk loudly. That may also affect the voice. So hearing is also important. Then some have TM joint dysfunction. Reflux, we'll come to refluxes uh, later on. So this is, we see the lesions uh, on the stroke. Generally, a voice therapist may be asked to join or may be given a recording so that he also understands the lesions. Now, I will not go into stroboscopy. You know, stroke is a have much to see the free edge of the vocal cord. And especially in this subgroup, uh, say professional voice users, it is more important than normal patients. There are some subtle findings, subtle lesions, which you can only pick up on the stroke. I'll just show you this. Now, this is a patient with vocal nodules. A very common problem. But you see the superior surface of the cords. There are, there are telangiectatic uh, vessels. There are hemorrhages. So, it is important to understand it is not just treating the vocal nodules, but attention to other associated lesions also. Now, this is a, it's a mucus retention cyst on the cord. Cords are pliable. The mucosal wave is not bad. So, but if you have more stiffer lesion, then you get worried. It's a different lesion. Now, see the sepidermoid cyst. Different from mucus retention cyst. So now a lot of these uh, professional voice users have sulcus, maybe a grade one sulcus. You may tend to miss it. And we, we are a, able to appreciate sulcus more when the cords are abducted. Now, 
Now you see this lesion. The, the, the mucosal wave is hardly there. It, it, these are rigid parts. So he merits a biopsy, probably a deeper biopsy. This turned out to be malignancy. So lesions are different and you have to apply yourself. Now, if you have hemorrhage on the vocal cord and a performer has a performance, it's a sort of emergency and you must handle it uh, in an emergent way. If this is one situation where I am all right giving oral steroids. Now, different types of vocal pathologies are there. A lot of these uh, vocal pathologies cause secondary muscle tension dysphonia. So we must not only treat the pathology, but also address the muscle tension dysphonia. Now, the performer may have change in voice quality. There may be more effort. The loudness may be reduced. There may be vocal fatigue. Stamina may be affected. Throat discomfort. And vocal agility may be lost. So there are different ways he can present to you. But you must learn to understand how the things are happening. Now, even posture is very important. Somebody with these high heel shoes may affect the voice subtly. Some people do tiptoeing. That, that may also affect the voice. The voice abuse. Uh, people, performers, they tend to practice uh, very aggressively and that may affect the voice. And the way you sing certain doodling, belting, while trying to give color to the voice, all that may affect the voice. So you have to be careful in uh, counseling them how much of their uh, practice or riyaz, as they call it in our language, they should must do. Now, some of them use this to give, like this gentleman, Mr. Mogambo, Amrish Puri, he has bogart bokal syndrome, which is a type of muscle tension dysphonia. Now, this gentleman, he sings, but he does a lot of gesturing. So, the, the singing voice may be affected. So, the counseling is to be there that uh, reduce the amount of gesturing you do. The stress element is always there. They are under a lot of stress to perform. So, you must understand them psychologically also, any psychosomatic problem. And the uh, stress may be affecting their voice. Allergy, you know, is very important. Post-nasal drip may cause dry cough, may irritate, and may affect the voice. That needs to be treated. And the resonance, apart from the voice, that may also be affected because of cold. The voice outcome, you know, there is no single way to assess voice. It may be perceptual or voice handicap index, which is a patient questionnaire or speech software. But there is no one perfect way. You have to combine all the three if you want outcome measure. Now, this is Grava score, which is done by the therapist, and he rates from zero to three on different aspects. The voice therapy is very important in these artists, our performers. Uh, we have to go slow in any aggressive uh, intervention. So voice therapy, the therapists will do it, but uh, we must understand the different aspects of voice therapy, how it is to be given for different lesions. And these are different type of exercises which can be given, but as a clinicians, we must spend time not doing voice therapy but understanding what is being done and how is it affecting the performer. So there are drugs which are a no-no for these performers. Avoid antihistamines, pseudoephedrine, which cause dryness. The blood thinners. Mine has a very strong cardiac uh, uh, say facility. So there are a lot of patients who come with vocal cord hemorrhages because they are on D-plat or aspirin. And avoid, uh, dissuade them from taking these menthols which uh, not only dry, but also cause reflux. Certain birth pills, they cause, uh, they affect the voice by viralizing the larynx. Dissuade uh, them from using topical sprays during their performance. It gives a feeling of uh, good feel. Numbness is there, but the voice quality goes down. Then steroids, they should not be misused. As I said, for vocal cord hemorrhage, I'm all right, but not for drop of a hat to use steroids. Antibiotics have hardly any role unless there is a sore throat with uh, pharyngitis or tonsillitis. Alcohol, again, before a performance, a strict no, because it causes exodus of water from the cells. It dehydrates and uh, the, the, email, the performer may feel better, but uh, the performance goes down. So I tell them, have a drink after your performance if you want. Indians love to eat, so heavy meals should be avoided during your, your practice or during performance. Take light. If you are light in stomach, you will sing well. Smoking, a big no, all times. It affects, you know, multiple ways it can affect all the components of uh, this. Intermittent voice rest is always advocated. And uh, in between days, we ask, we ask them to cut down the social chit chatting. A lot of hydration, about 1.5 to 2 liters of water should go in daily. And even when they're performing or they're talking, you should have this glass of water always ready. 
Now, breathing exercises are good. There are several ways these are done. Even in Indian, uh, say, different other forms of medicines, Ayurveda, homeopathy, then you have religious healers, speakers, they teach them breathing exercises. I have nothing against them. I encourage my patients to do as long as they know what they are doing. And uh, it increases the lung power. Reflux is there, whether we are believers or non-believers. But almost everybody's come to accept that there is element of reflux, directly or indirectly. And uh, it helps to treat reflux, even if the, the, say, the symptoms of DRD are not there. A lot of times, reflux is silent. And by simple lifestyle modifications, sleeping two hours after dinner, sleeping with a pillow, or not staying hungry for more than four hours, you can do a lot. PPIs we do give post-operatively also for empirically for two to three weeks. In established LPR, we give it longer duration, double the dose. But get not a few things like don't clear throat by then if you have to do silent cough technique, a lot of hydration. Steaming is excellent. Encourage them to even steam twice daily and avoid alcohol, chocolate, caffeine before a performance. Warm up is important. Breathe down low in the chest. Humming is a very good form of warm up. Then you do lip drills, tongue drills, syllable drills. So these are different ways you, you, you warm up before your performance. And you, you listen to Lataji, our foremost singer, with age, how the our voice is affected. Because of paucity of time, I will not run you through all the five. But you just see the 50s, how you used to sing. <laughs> Now, 40 years down the lane, now see her voice. There is a. So each performer will change, his voice will change with the age. They have to learn to accept that. You, we have to tell them, and they may have to change what they are singing. Surgery, yes, some people we have to do surgery when it becomes unavoidable, but we can be slow. I use laser in performance, no problem. If it's a quality laser, we use luminous laser with a scanner. And uh, you cut to a precision about 100 uh, microns. And uh, I'm all right with that. Uh, people who don't use laser or don't have laser, it's perfectly all right to use phonomicrosurgery techniques. And uh, now this sort of a lesion, a sulcus, now here, if a performer has this, don't give them performance in the mood. You know, the results of voice results with off sulcus are uh, not going to be as dramatic as, say, taking out a polyp or doing thyroplasty. So they are counseled about that in the beginning. And uh, we, 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 we are careful with how much we, uh, what we promise them. Now, this is a laser resection of a, say, polypoidal lesion. Now, I'll run you through. See, this is a hemorrhagic polyp, and at the end of the procedure, it's fairly uh, clearly taken out, and you use these welding spots. Suppose you have uh, hemorrhages on the superior surface or slight oozing, you can use a uh, scanner within the scanner mode and help you out. Now, see this singer? She is a Bangla singer. She... So her voice is breaks in higher pitches. It is normal speaking voice, normal flat singing voice, but in higher pitches is breaking. So again, this needs a lot of voice therapy, counseling, uh, trying to understand what she's singing, and uh, many sessions with her. No surgery was done in this, but this uh, this is our Ranvi singer. You listen to her. Melodious voice, but again breaking. She had a vocal polyp, which was excised, and uh, she got all right. A Sufi singer. So India, we have different forms of singing. Now you listen to him. <laughs> Now, you, you see this was the lesion before uh, surgery and this is the part on table and his voice improved. 
uh, with the oxygen of this region. So you have to do surgery sometimes, but you reach low. So the other important aspect is if you, you have to go non undergo non laryngeal surgery. Again, the surgeon, even if he's not an ENT surgeon, must be aware of that the, the person is a performer. And uh, say elective surgeries or surgeries for benign lesions, if it can be avoided, should be avoided. And if they are operating abdomen, thorax, they have to be told about the levers. Next surgery is avoid cutting strap muscles. They are important. And then care of bicranial laryngeal, marginal mandibular nerve, platysma, uh, even say in some mandibular gland excision. Drop of a hat, don't do a tonsillectomy or uvulopalatoplasty because the voice may not be affected, but the resonance is affected. Then you have septoplasty. A simple operation like septoplasty can also affect resonance. It's slow in non laryngeal surgery. Thank you. I will stop here. Again, it's a vast topic, but uh, this is just to initiate. And I'll be happy to take questions in the second part. And now I ask uh, Dr. Tassos, who's from Cleveland Clinic, Abu Dhabi, to take this talk on stars and sulcus. Dr. Tassos, please. Thank you. Thank you, KK. Thank you for this very interesting talk. Let me share my screen. Hold on a minute, there it is. I believe you see that? Yes, we are seeing. Good. All right then, okay. All right, so um, the topic that I'm, I will discuss with you is, is basically uh, uh, the, the fear of every laryngologist. This is the treating vocal folds and uh, vocal folds scars and salsi. Simply because, you know, the results and that we may get uh, are not always optimal. And uh, these are difficult lesions that the extent and the effect that they create uh, is very different from person to person. Um, given some of the, uh, of the, um, uh, the, the, first of all, what the descriptions of vocal fold scar uh, as terminology, vocal fold scars as defined by, by Benninger, are the result of from surgical removal, either from benign or malignant vocal fold lesions, phonotrauma, intubation, but this may happen over an extended period of time. Um, this is all familiar to all of you, is the microanatomy of the vocal fold as been described by, by uh, the uh, Hieranos cover body theory, having an epithelial layer that is sliding over the superficial layer of the lamina propria that composes the cover um, and having the uh, intermediate and deep layer of the lamina propria composing the body. Um, and, and this is basically the theory of the vocal fold vibration that um, we base our, our uh, definitions and we base our treatment on. So having this in mind, um, believing what core is scar formation, it is basically described as changes in the microstructure and the elasticity of the vocal fold lamina propria that affects the oscillations of the vocal folds. Um, and we know that this is a, a constant trauma and mechanical injury that will trigger a cascade of inflammation um, and a healing response, which is followed by the tissue restoration. And this tissue restoration is not always an optimal one. So the main features of vocal fold scarring uh, is that we have collagen and elastin bundles that are disorganized. And there's a loss of some of the constituents of the uh, extracellular mi matrix that are very important for restoring uh, the uh, mechanical injured, mechanically injured sites. And this may result to a volume deficiency and thus a reduced pliability of the vocal folds and uh, a glottal insufficiency. Um, now, we know and we have found through, uh, through our research, uh, basic science research, that there are certain site-specific fibrous blasts. And these are responsible for uh, the synthesis of certain uh, interstitial proteins that are very important, uh, such as the fibronectin, such as the glycosinamina glycans, such as the hyaluronic acid, and also um, different uh, types of elastic fibers. The problem is that during this fibrogenesis, uh, there is a transformation of this site-specific fi uh, via fibroblast to myofibroblasts, which basically are the ones that can form eventually the scar. And this has the effect on the production uh, of biological behavior and the, the profile of, of the ACM. 
And so this is, you know, a few things about the pathogenesis of that. Now, going to the other side, the sulcus vocalis uh, has similar features with the scar, and that's why we put them all together, basically because these affect the way that the vocal folds vibrate. Um, and apart from, you know, uh, from uh, these, uh, the scar formation, skull vocalis is, is a bit of a different entity. It's, it's basically described and defined as a laryngeal condition that uh, is linked to a heterogeneous defect of the covering epithelium uh, that leads to structural malformation of the vocal fold. This may be a different range, either a minor invagination or a, to a deeper uh, focal pit. Um, and there's been, at the, in the past, some attempts to classify these. Uh, so there's been the initial attempt by uh, Monde, uh, Bouchaillet and Cornu in France in 1983 that had described two types of, uh, of salsa. One is a true sulcus that we may eventually uh, describe as an ep open epidermoid cyst uh, that has an epithelium that is thickened uh, and it's adhering to the uh, vocal ligament, as opposed to the sulcus vegetative that basically corresponds to the atrophy of the mucosa that covers the vocal ligament. Now, a fourth later, and more than 10 years later, added an extra category uh, which described as a non-pathological type 1 sulcus, which is limited to the superficial lamina propria and usually has no functional impact. This is something that we all, uh, most of us may have seen during examination patients having small sulci that do not really have a significant uh, phonatory impact. On the other hand, there's a pathologic type 2, uh, which again is subdivided, uh, subdivided in a type A and a type B, and the type 2A is the one that is, is basically the same as the true uh, sulcus. Uh, with, sorry, with the, with the sulcus vegetal described by the Bouchaillet, which is an atrophic epithelium that causes moderate dysphonia and involvement of the loss of the superficial lamina propria, with possible involvement of the vocal ligaments, but has an intact vocalis muscle. And the type 2B, which is a true sulcus or pouch type, which causes severe dysphonia. Um, now, um, this is a, a description and, uh, and design as from the initial. Uh, paper by Bouchaillet and Cornu about the different two types that they initially described, uh, that you can see that they describe uh, the type uh, sulcus vegetator as one uh, would be a similar to an open cyst. Um, now, there have been also some other etiolo etiologies that have been also described, uh, such as that these may be of congenital um, um, origin as a result of fourth and sink sprinkle arch uh, anomalies. Uh, also reports of familiar occurrence, and also um, the fact that uh, another study in Japan that found uh, high incidence of sulcus deformities uh, in pathological examination of laryngeal cancer and suggested that it may be of an acquired origin uh, resulting from local trauma or chronic inflammation. Um, nevertheless, we, we, uh, through a panel with uh, the American Laryngological Association, the ALS, uh, we decided to make a proposal combining <laughs> all these different uh, classifications basically because we wanted to base this uh, on, uh, on on certain things on, on depth and location so so we have the normal citizen description as you can see um, of, of uh, normal there's a type m1 which is basically uh, describes the atrophy of the lamina propria with or without affect epithelium uh, and these are characterized by an incomplete glottic closure with bowing uh, of the vocal folds on a stroboscopy um, and for example, this may be various types of atrophy of the lamina propria uh, or agingly rated vocal fold atrophy, such as in press by larynx. And these also include the superficial sulcus, the sulcus vegetal, sulcus vocalis, and mucosal bridge with or without sulcus. And also there's a subdivision for laterality, like type 1A unilateral and type 1B bilateral. In type 2, we included uh, the ones that uh, the uh, the, uh, the conditions that alter the pliability of, of the vocal folds, and this result in stiffening of the mucosal wave, which may be a secondary to phonotrauma, uh, either phonotrauma or direct trauma, or iatrogenic or post-radiation, or from chronic chemical irritation, such as in smoking and in reflux disease. Um, and these may vary from minimal changes in the epithelium, uh, but also um, in uh, um, stiffening, simple stiffening of the vocal fold edge or minimal reduction in the mucosal wave, but extending to even partial or complete uh, removal um, of uh, the erythroid or arytenoid muscle, extension of scar formation throughout the heavy larynx, and severe impairment of the mucosal wave with a complete glottic closure. Um, this condition again, um, typical causes may range from phonotrauma or intubation trauma, smoking or reflux 
or such as we can see in uh, ELS type one to four uh, chordectomies, uh, which uh, create a more of, of a glottic gap. And again, laterality for subdivisions. A type three, uh, as you can see, is a scar that is located in the anterior commissure. And a type four is the one that is, uh, is included in the anterior posterior and retro, uh, retrochordal axis uh, with a significant uh, loss of vocal fold mass. Uh, so this is something that may happen after extended chordectomy, such as in uh, uh, five, uh, type five ELS type chordectomies, um, or in, even with the partial laryngectomies, open ones or um, um, endoscopic ones. So as you can see, we try to combine all the different categories that exist. And the diagnostic workup includes stroboscopy. Uh, and obviously it's very important to have high definition, um, cameras uh, and to have uh, both rigid and flexible endoscopes in our monetarium. And as you can see, we can have a simple scar formation, as you can see, which is quite an extensive scar, as you can see on the right of this. Uh, we can also have uh, mixed pathologies, as you can see in this video clip that we have bilateral salsa, uh, but because of the differences in the laboratory panel, okay, the chairs, there have been some uh, development, I'm sorry, let me reduce the sound development of, of uh, small um, um, phalangectasias on the superior um, um, uh, cover of the vocal folds, the epithelial lining of the vocal fold. So uh, treatment options. Um, we can start with voice therapy. Um, most of us have been, maybe start with voice therapy, but the results of voice therapy, particularly when we have uh, deep scars, are not very promising. Uh, we can do trials basically to do the uh, voice profile of these patients and do some initial attempts, um, but um, it's usually not as effective as we would want. And obviously then we can uh, have more aggressive techniques such as microlaryngeal surgery, augmentation, utilization, thyroplasty, and uh, the most modern um, addition in our monetary stem cell injection. Um, now, this is some pictures of a, a mucosal bridge, as you can see, a, a picture of a sulcus that was incidentally detected um, as a finding of the contralateral vocal fold, not just the primary finding. Um, and this is also something that we may encounter having patients that have a unilateral pathology of a polyp. Uh, and so we always have to be very cautious looking at the contralateral side that we may detect different pathologies such as a sulcus. Um, then, as I mentioned, augmentation and medialization thyroplasty are, are two of the suggested uh, treatments, so either with any sort of implant, as we know that the medialization thyroplasty is used basically for glottic insufficiency that has resulted from vocal paralysis, but it can be uh, used also to uh, push um, and medialize a, an affected epithelium from a sulcus vocalis. And also injection for certain fillers, Hyaluronic acid is uh, the injectable filler of my preference, um, but anyone can have any type of injectable materials that anyone uh, can be familiar with. Um, other techniques is, is basically removing that epithelium that is adhering to the vocal ligament, uh, either by cold steer or laser instrumentation, um, and exposing in the vocal ligament, and then um, undermining the um, the distal uh, part of the mucosa and trying to resuture that and resurface it over it uh, with, uh, with sutures. Um, this is a, a clip of uh, sulcus treatment. As you can see, uh, I try to undermine the surface of the vocal fold and create a pocket. This is also another technique that one may apply. Try to basically take uh, the sulcus uh, away from uh, the, the epithelium away from uh, the uh, underlying vocal ligaments and then inject. And as you can see, this is the result after injection of uh, hyaluronic acid. Um, further moving, uh, again, this is a, a more aggressive approach, trying to again elevate a scar uh, that has been formed and exposing uh, the, uh, the vocal fold ligaments. It's, it's quite um, difficult to try to elevate when there's a, a sulc that can be applied for sulcus. And then as you can see, you can place 
um, and trying to, to clean that area and then undermining, and as you can see, I use a cotton bud to try to undermine the epithelium and then research that with uh, five or six so vital sutures. Um, the slicing techniques by Pontus, I'm not, um, I have not applied that. I don't know if any of you has applied that. I just have put that as a, one of the proposed uh, techniques. As you can see, there are certain slices that are made uh, on the surface of the sulcus in different distances, quite short distances uh, apart, and then um, elevation of the sulcus and uh, freeing throughout the whole depth of the sulcus. Um, this is also something that's been described. Uh, results of, from the author uh, were, were, were promising. Uh, this is another technique, again, that's trying to remove um, the um, scarified tissue uh, over um, the uh, underlying vocal ligament and exposing the vocal ligament and then uh, creating um, or vocal ligament over the undersurface and then harvesting a, a buccal a graft and then suturing over the exposed area. Um, this is a, a technique that is basically used when we have deep scars uh, with significant glottal gap. As you can see, this is a, a post um gap uh, that also has resulted in an in anterior glottic web. Uh, so this can be combined um, together with, with, uh, um, with a, a separation of the glottic web uh, with a CO2 laser. You can see uh, the uh, overlying scar has been removed. Uh, the uh, glottic web has been opened with the laser. Uh, and this is how the buccal uh, graft is being applied and sutured. Um, and, and this is the result that has been about uh, three months post-op. A keel was also placed and wrapped uh, for the um, anterior commissure to prevent restenosis of the glottic web. Um, this is another case of a patient uh, that has come to me with uh, uh, post-radiation scarring. Uh, this patient at the age of two was diagnosed with histios, uh, um, fibrous histiocytoma of the larynx and had radiation therapy at that time in London. Um, subsequently, now he's, he's almost in his 50s. Now, subsequently, he had um, about um, 10 years, 20 years later, he had an injection um, at the Mayo Clinic that uh, appeared to be quite satisfactory for about 10 years. He had a reinjection at another facility and uh, this is obviously, as you can see, um, um, the problem that he has with a slight scar at the anterior third of the right vocal fold. Um, and so the patient is not happy basically because he's raising his pitch. He's compensating by raising pitch. Uh, and because being a businessman, he, his voice has been significantly affected. So he cannot really communicate clearly. Um, so, so what I did, uh, I did, as you see, an office injection. Uh, this is uh, the guardian technique. So I used the fiber endoscope to instill some 4% uh, because it was, uh, it was a lighter thing uh, over the original implant by the patient's asked to uh, guard it. Um, and um, I'll just move it. So you can see I use uh, the injection from the prepothyroid membrane. Basically, you can see the point of the needle entering and inject the material in the diaglottic space. But noticeable that because of the scar tissue, this migrates more laterally to the diaglottic space, and some of that also extends uh, up the laryngeal ventricle, but it attempts to somehow medialize the, the anterior part. Um, this patient, uh, this, uh, this material uh, basically got absorbed fairly quickly, and I have attempted reinjection, I've attempted uh, you know, steroid injections, and uh, the, the, I've managed only to somehow control this voice pitch very little. Uh, as you can see, this is about a year later after multiple attempts and reinjection, that a patient has not really improved significantly on the vibratory pattern, but was happy that he had a lower uh, registry of his voice. Um, moving. Um, so this is it's another patient, this is a patient you see uh, after that significant time that has not really been able to form it properly after so many attempts. Um, steroid injection, a patient that has multiple surgeries uh, at an outside facility and came with a significant scar 
we go back, uh, significant scar uh, on the right vocal fold. As you can see, he has a very, very vibratory pattern. Um, I offered to him to do more extensive uh, procedure rather than removing that, and he uh, declined. I did a steroid injection for him. He had very little benefit. Uh, I know that uh, Ramon Franco is, is uh, from the Harvard, is, is very uh, keen on doing repetitive uh, steroid injection and claiming that he has uh, good results with that. It's something I'll try to offer him, but the patient did not uh, show up on future appointments. Tissue engineering is, is the new modality. As we know, the, the works from uh, Shigeru Hirano, administration of external growth factors, uh, results in stimulation of the endogenous uh, hyaluronic acid production. And some certain uh, growth factors have been identified, the epidermal growth factor, the basic fibroblast growth factor, the transforming growth factor, uh, beta-1, and the hepatocyte growth factor, both in in vitro and in vivo experiments have shown promising results. Stem cell um, therapy is an other, uh, another modality that has shown improved vibration characteristics with reduced lamina propria thickness and decreased amounts of uh, type uh, 1 collagen that induces fibrosis. We know that a lot of stem cells are also included in fat, so um, fat injections in this area may be also something that may promote um, um, these, uh, uh, these, these features of improving vibration characteristics. Um, as to conclude, scars and salsi, variation of the same problem, we uh, cause an impaired mucosal vibration. Um, none of the available treatment options provide a significant successful result. We have to be flexible and try to propose to the patient, uh, but not really promise results. Uh, and proper patient selection is also of paramount importance. It depends very much on how deep the, um, this, uh, the scar is, how much the quality of the life is affected, what the profession of the patient is, and all these factors have been to, uh, taken uh, into account. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kassos, uh, very enlightening talk on the scars and sulci. Uh, now we will move on to the panel. Questions pertaining, pertaining to these three talks. Uh, all the audience members, please be free to uh, message. They must have told you. And we will take up either at the end of the panel or during the course of the pa panel. Now we are joined by my other panelists, uh, Dinesh and Tassos, you've already met. We have Dr. Amitabh Roy Chaudhary, he's already been introduced. Dr. Thiru, he's also been introduced. Dr. Patam Khan, he is from Guwahati, uh, Assam, Northeast part of India. He's a ENT surgeon. And Dr. Anand Sharma, he is an anesthetist at my hospital, Medanta Medicity. And uh, he assists me in all the airway anesthesia. So now we will come to the panel. Just let me switch it on. Are you seeing the share screen? Yes, sir. Yes, we are. So the first question to be addressed by panelists are, how many of you are back to work? Uh, Tessos, are you fully back to work or partially yeah. back to work? Fully back to work for the past, I uh, would say, uh, since, since June, for the oh. past three months. But COVID has been kind in Middle East, so... Uh, it's not that it was kind in the Middle East, it's just that our hospital uh, has become a COVID-free hospital. Most of the COVID cases at that time were controlled to the point that they could be uh, funneled to uh, other hospitals, other facilities. So 
we essentially became a COVID-free hospital to treat some more uh, severe cases that would otherwise not have access to a hospital because of COVID. Uh, Dinesh, what is the status in Los Angeles, UCLA? Well, we've been working the whole time, but we've had many changes to our standard operating procedures. So with those in place, we are fully open. Uh, Gautam, surgical work? So it's reduced. We are doing maybe 25% of what we used to do. And Amitabh, does the situation same with you also? Yeah, I think it's the same. I think one important point, what uh, Dr. Tassos pointed out, that whether your hospital is taking uh, having a COVID wing or COVID patients, and the geography of the hospital will dictate, I think, for us, all of us. But it has substantially uh, reduced clinic and surgical work. So, uh, yes, uh, everywhere, probably there are COVID referral hospitals. And there are some hospitals which are not COVID hospitals. But in India, the situation is some hospitals are catering to both. So what our hospital has done is it's divided almost all of the hospital into two halves. One is the COVID part and there is a non-COVID part. So there is, a, there is a national obligation also for COVID patients and we are able to do our normal work. Uh, and now, surprisingly, past week or so, the, the bed issue has come. The, the, the non-COVID part is becoming uh, full. So I think most of us are back to work. Maybe not full work, but back to work. Now, uh, Dinesh, are you doing only emergency surgeries or even routine laryngological surgeries also? So um, we are now doing everything, but I just have to give you a backdrop. At the beginning, we obviously were only doing what we considered urgent surgeries. But at some point, uh, we started to COVID test patients. And also the hospital realized that the revenue was significantly down from reducing our workload by about 80%. So around April, they had updated their COVID testing to the point that they could test every patient who wanted surgery. And so we started to COVID test two days before surgery. And I would say starting in April or May, what we realized looking at the trend line for hospitalization that the numbers were very, very stable in the hospital because the whole point was not to overwhelm the system. Uh, once they realized that hospitalizations and ICU beds were fairly stable in terms of COVID patients, then they were more open to doing surgeries. And so we did go from emergency to urgent surgery to now we're doing uh, all, all operations. So we've gone through many phases, I should say. Through yeah. you know, uh, airway surgeries, you started doing your resection and end-to-ends and PCRs. Um, uh, no, uh, no. Actually, uh, it's not like back to work for me because uh, we've never been off work because uh, you know the emergencies in pediatrics. Uh, you know, it, it kept coming uh, from, from the beginning, and uh, initially we we were doing only the emergencies. You know, real emergencies, something like um, button battery injection or something like a bronchial uh, foreign body, something like that. We thought, you know, the situation will ease out after some time and then maybe we will start the rest of the thing. But, uh, you know, uh, the situation is like now uh, we, we don't know when it is going to end. Slowly, we also started doing some essential works, not only emergencies and essential surgeries also we have started uh, doing uh, in, in the past uh, maybe one month or uh, so. But not exactly the end to end anastomosis or you know PCTR or that kind of uh, work. You know, whenever you think the patient can wait for some more time, we still we are waiting. And uh, if you, you can't wait, you know something like endoscopic surgeries, uh, then we are doing. I think that's a very valid point. A situation where you have grade three stenosis and uh, he merits LTR or a resection end to end. Uh, but you will do a balloon dilatation and ask him to uh, say buy some time. That I have done in a couple of my patients. Yeah. Dr. Anand Sharma, he's the anesthetist in Vedanta. Uh, when we, I know, uh, when we, as an anesthetist, uh, 
what is your take surgeons are obviously aggressive in uh, say advising surgery operating but as anesthetists so uh, let let me be honest it's frightening because we are aware that intubation and laryngeal exposure is a very uh, aerosol generating procedure and for all other surgeries the whole crux of the anesthesia guidelines has been to minimize it as much as possible and to protect everyone but when we look at a laryngeal or voice surgery where actually that is the whole center of of the whole operation so everyone in the theater is going to be exposed to it for a prolonged period of time i mean not prolonged but basically more than what we are supposed to so it's something that we've taken really seriously to minimize exposure to us and to everyone else in the hospital and the net result of this is that while once upon a time a micro laryngeal surgery or a laser surgery would something they would have been a fast act a very high output procedure we would do five or six within 3 or 4 hours now it slowed down things a bit so we have to spend time pre op preparing the ot preparing the staff within the ot the time is slightly longer because we tend to be careful and double check everything and the between ot turnover time has increased because we need to make the case safe for the next patient that comes in, the ot comes in. so it's a bit scary and obviously we've again limited this to our senior anesthetists people who are actually taking this seriously to ensure that the patient is safe as well as the staff is safe for this procedure so uh don't go by his all words he he is not scared he has uh, we are doing cases and he's uh, they are all the senior people are there in the front line though time taken is more the precautions all guidelines are followed but uh, there is no no to any case which is being taken up but as you rightly said we will not yeah, yeah. refuse a case if it needs to be yeah, done it needs so, to be done absolutely yeah so there is no refusal at the most suppose the covid testing has not been done it will be treated as a covid uh, patient the the pp uh, the uh, say the top most pp will we have to be worn as per guidelines but no single case has been refused one important thing what uh, dinesh brought out is the also the question of livelihood the, he talked of the hospital finances but let us face it a lot of uh, our colleagues they are working in small setups so for how long it has been 6 months so indefinitely people cannot go off their practices also uh, till a certain time it was acceptable but now uh, people have to come back uh, Do- uh, dr tassos your comment on that Yes, I mean I agree. I mean that's the that's the way it is. And as as Dinesh pointed out, we had the same issues. At some point, you know, they realized that the revenue was significantly low, and they were looking at options how we can possibly start by doing some of the elective surgeries. Initially, uh, when when we had a lot of COVID cases within the hospital and we're accepting much everything, um, we we were also uh, you know sent it to different you know services to try to help our colleagues. For example, I spent. a week in the covid icu um just you know to deflect the situation uh from my other colleagues and to you know take calls from the uh from the icu and anesthesiologists and the intensivists that were you know in in the unit um so but but it's we realized that the when things and the numbers started to stabilize and not to increase that we could start opening so we have implemented a similar protocol by uh doing covid test with every patient um Uh, that comes within 72 hours a patient has to have a covid test um within all elective surgeries uh, from from as i said from early june um and we working full speed ahead and on the and we have actually managed to to somehow not close the gap but you know have better scores than the previous years in this particular time of the year uh, as compared to the same periods of time from the previous years so um but but yes i understand that you know initially in the clinic and still we implementing a lot of ppes we getting a lot of protective measures you know we still have converted some of the examination rooms in particular the procedure rooms to negative pressure rooms we have installed hepa filters to to facilitate and you know, have them available for the other patients to come in after you know doing a, a office procedure or examining one patient um and um we continue as such I understand that this is something that cannot apply to every hospital 
you know, you need to have the appropriate, you know, uh, uh, the appropriate, you know, cooling systems and the appropriate systems and, and air conditioning systems that can make these conversions. Um, but, you know, we're just, you know, lucky that in our place, uh, uh, we were able to do this in a commodity situation. In a country like India, we have variable setups. We have some very high quality setups. We have solo setups, which uh, may not have the perfect system. We have a uh, government sector where again, some very good institutions are there, but by and large. So we have to cater uh, to even make the best of whatever situation we are in. Exactly. Like negative pressure rooms, maybe our hospital has it, but there are very few centers who can afford to have a, a say negative pressure even in the OPD basis. Now Gautam, your comments on the type of setup, uh, how to modify, have you done something in your setup? Gautam has a sort of a standalone ENT setup. So Gautam from a, say Northeast part of India, your comments on this? Uh, sir, uh, we, uh, we, I'm practically working in two hospitals at present. One the, that you know is Nightingale, where it's a small setup. It's, uh, uh, we do not have any high-end uh, sort of uh, effective environment. So what we have done is for the, um, uh, the gas, we do not have the scavenging system for the anesthetic gas. So we have actually done some, as we say, we call it Indian Jugar. We have attached a tube through from the ventilator to the to an exhaust and taken it outside, so as to have a scavenging system for the and I say, of course, we have the HME filters, etc., in place when we intubate. We take the necessary precautions of putting a tent when we intubate, not having enough personnel inside. And we always do the COVID testing uh, prior to taking the patient to the OR. Uh, but in the other hospital, they have the scavenging system, but it's not a negative pressure OT, as mentioned. So, see, today innovation is required. Last two, three days, I was a small part of a MIT hackathon. This is looking at COVID problems in India. And they had about 2,000 uh, people participating, a small team form. And, uh, we were really astonished by the by the amount of innovations which young minds can think of, and very very applicable to a country like ours where resources are uh, are scarce, population is large, resources are scarce. So what Gotham has done for the gases, lot of lot of these things have to be improvised. Now, now coming to OPD procedures, Dr. Amitabh. Now, do you think this flexible fiber optic laryngoscopy is an aerosol generating procedure? Um, obviously, I consider it, it, it is an aerosol, but there has been debate on this, whether it really does. There have been studies, there has been scintigraphic studies, many things, but uh, we take this procedure to be a potentially, potentially aerosol generating procedure. And therefore, uh, we have to do this. We, have, we are regularly doing it, but we take all the pro precautions that we would have taken. Uh, for uh, doing an aerosol generating procedure. I'm not going into that debate whether how much aerosol it generates. So if you ask me uh, how we are doing it, we are routinely doing it flexible laryngoscopy. First of all, prioritizing it because uh, in the earlier time, we used to see a patient in the clinic and do the screening uh, laryngoscopy uh, in the same room. Now, obviously, we have created a separate room for that. And we, have, we are giving appointment for the patients to do uh, uh, the uh, uh, flexible laryngoscopy. And we are doing uh, with a vent mask, what we call it a vent mask. This was adapted from a study in the US uh, that you make a small hole in the mask, uh, make the patient wear that mask that we provide. And the mask is, uh, we have uh, two pieces of uh, gloves, the material stapled on the inner and outer side and then make a hole so that it's like a valve and then you tape everything so if, even if the patient coughs uh, and we take all the precautions so that the patient does not cough no spray just decongested nose drop and a quick laryngoscopy that's what we are doing because it is potentially and obviously we are having our protective gear of n95 goggles face shield and uh, disposable uh, you know wear-ons and those things 
the full protection is there. Yes. Dinesh, your comments on flexible fiber optic in OPD setup as an aerosol genetic procedure? Yeah, so, you know, I agree with Amitabh. One of the issues that we faced from the beginning is that there is absolutely no studies looking at aerosol generation from fiber optic laryngoscopy. And if you look at the risk for COVID, probably the highest on the list is endotracheal intubation, you know, and then it's tracheostomy and then masking during endotracheal intubation. A lot of these procedures that we do in the operating room. Going to the risk of fiber optic laryngoscopy, you know, one of the ways to look at it is to say, okay, it's kind of like putting a nasogastric tube, right? We are very quick, uh, atraumatically putting the scope in the throat. You look at it for one minute. And actually they have done studies with uh, so, uh, SARS looking at risk of these things. And what they find is, for example, doing nasogastric intubation is, is not, let's call it aerosol generating. So you have to kind of weigh of course, even when we speak, we're making aerosols. And then there's a, there's a controversy about, well, what is the part, how many particles do you need to get the, get the disease? So then it becomes very, very complex. So what we decided to do here uh, is basically to consider uh, laryngoscopy, non-aerosol generating, talking about transnasal, not transoral, uh, and or low enough that it is worth the risk of doing a quick uh, laryngoscopy. Now, we of course have the patient have a mask. We are doing it atraumatically. We're not spraying. We're putting a pledget in the nose. And then we are also wearing N95 gloves and gowns. So I, I would put, and then there are several studies now, you know, both in Odo HNS and laryngoscope looking at some ways to see if fiber optic laryngoscopy is really aerosol generating or not. And I think generally they think it's very low unless the patient coughs a lot or sneezes. So again, I think for me, if I remember to do it atraumatically, minimize the scope time, and then use the PPE, and also patient wears a mask. One last thing I should say is we always screen, of course, the patients coming through the doors. They get screened downstairs with temperature and, and questionnaire, and then upstairs in the clinic. So we're really trying hard. But having said that, you can never say, you know, you, you never know. So you, you should be, you should always assume that the patient, you know, has COVID and work that way. Oh, very pertinent point. Even if it is not uh, classified as aerosol genetic procedure, it is, it is a risky procedure and we must all be careful. Other very practical tip he gave is, rather than do a 10% spray or a 4% spray, better to put a pleasure which is probably safer than uh, just doing a spray. And uh, what Amitabh said, you can uh, at least make a patient wear a mask. And you can improvise those masks, how to do it, but uh, at least make a patient wear a mask. So you are safe, patient is safe. Now, another uh, thought is, like in nasal uh, surgeries, today more and more people are accepting that rather than do a nasal endoscopy as a diagnostic procedure, you straight away go for a CT scan. NCCT PNS, which is acceptable. The information you get is probably more with a CT rather than a uh, endoscope. Now, TESOS regarding laryngology, do you think there is a, there is an alternative for flexible laryngoscopy, or we have all to do flexible laryngoscopy, or a 90 degree telescopy, or a stroboscopy to arrive at a diagnosis? Well. Um... It's not an option, honestly. I mean, even for, for nasal surgery, we have to look at the looks of the mucosa. We have to take a glimpse of how the vocal folds vibrate. And this cannot be replaced by any imaging. And if the imaging can give us structures that, you know, that are still images, but we, we rely on the function and the functional assessment that we do when we do stroboscopy or laryngoscopy. So, so uh, unfortunately, we don't have any other option rather than taking our precautions, taking our measures, trying to do that, as Dinesh said, with, uh, with uh, minimal you know, um, uh, irritation of, of the linings, not to induce any cough or sneezing, and, and do our job uh, the best we can. Uh, obviously, if we feel that there is a need to proceed with imaging, we will do that, but we base that, as we you know, from, from what we see and, and what are the questions that are raised when we have uh, a functional assessment and an assessment of the larynx and the mucosa. I think everybody will agree that there is no replacement to uh, scopic examination. Unlike nose, a CT probably 
can just order a CT and uh, get most of the things. Uh, now, Dr. Amita, yes, yes, please. Sorry, I wanted to mention something. You know, when we uh, uh, first started, we actually went to a lot of video visits. So that's what happened. We went from having in-person visits to video visits. And I realized pretty soon, for, at least for laryngology, I ended up telling the patient, well, I hear what you're saying, but I have to have you come in and I have to take a look at your larynx. So for a lot of things that we do, like Tasha said, we have to take a look. Yeah, but what has happened is regarding video visit in laryngology, I get a lot of pictures or video clips. They have been scoped somewhere else or they have photos. So that is enough to guide you. In those situations, we are able to advise. But unless you see, obviously, you cannot uh, devise a management protocol. Now, this question is to Dr. Anand. Now, now, consenting, has it changed in the COVID times okay, for a surgical patient undergoing surgery? As anesthetist, have you, so, what is uh, your consenting? There is a generic consent form that has been developed by the hospital, which the patient has to understand and sign uh, that I am actually undergoing treatment in the time of a COVID pandemic and that we are might be subjected to so that basically we are much safer at home but if you're going ahead for the surgery in a hospital i'm actually exposing myself to the risk of catching this infection so while that does not analyze that doesn't absolve us of the responsibility of protecting him and us from him this adds another consent that it needs to be uh, explained to the patient as far as the procedural consent goes the procedure consent if the patient is asymptomatic and his tests are negative, then I don't see an additional, I don't make any additional uh, allowance per se for COVID. I basically explain the, the standard procedure consent. But the, the, the consent in the time of pandemic has been added, the procedural consent in time of pandemic has been added. I think it's added to all admissions in the hospital. So that patients are aware that they're actually increasing, exposing themselves to a greater risk as soon as they step out, there, out of their house. Hiru, as a surgeon, you have added something? Yeah, I mean, initially, we, you know, we had uh, in our uh, surgeons and anesthetists meeting whether to get a separate consent for uh, COVID or whether to do um, uh, RT-PCR uh, testing once or twice and uh, asking them to write that, you know, there is a chance of getting infection in the hospital. And those things are uh, discussed. And over the period of time since, you know, it is uh, going on and everybody knows this is a pandemic and uh, the patients are coming knowing that there is a risk and uh, knowing that uh, the, there is no other way they can uh, um, avoid uh, surgery at this particular time. So uh, they are coming and everybody knows this and there is no point in getting an uh, extra, uh, uh, you know, new consent for uh, anything. If you start writing about a new thing, then that will go on, on and on. So um, finally, we, we are like, you know, Know, we stuck to the original consent, whatever we are getting already, we are going ahead with the surgeries. And everybody knows that, even patients accept for that, and we are also, you know, uh, um, accepting the fact that we are working in a pandemic. Dinesh, any, any change in your consent forms for surgical patients? Well, I, you know, as, as far as I know, we, you know, we've looked at our, you know, retrospectively, just looking to see patients who came to the hospital, did they get COVID? Is there a risk for that? both to the patients and the healthcare workers. So I've actually had to do the opposite, which is to tell patients it is okay because many patients are very afraid to come and get the surgery. And so you have to look at your own institution and say, is it safe for them? And if so, you can say it is safe. I actually happen to work in several settings. It's like a tale of two hospitals. I have one where patients are hyper aware of the disease and they come masked and they're very, very afraid and they don't wanna get the disease. And I have another hospital where Patients come and they, you ask them questions and they say, yep, I have these. You send them to urgent care, they, they become COVID positive. So again, you, you should really base it on your own hospital and, and you know, also the, the PCR test. We happen to be very comfortable now that our uh, PCR test has a very uh, low false positive. So it's like false positive less than 0.3%. So if your test is very good, then you can say yes, you know, this is quite safe for both the patient and the doctor. So again, based, based, based it on your hospital system. Now, 
before we come to precaution of no, pre operative uh, covid testing i think everybody in the panel is doing anybody in the panel who is not doing pre operative covid testing for any surgeries unless it's emergency situation uh, and you treat him as a covid which is different anybody who is not doing so everybody is doing only the days may vary somebody may be doing 48 hours 72 hours our hospital protocol is one week but if the patient is asymptomatic if during the week he has developed symptoms then we repeat a test so i think uh, this has become mandatory like your hepatitis or aids and even in the times to come this uh, rt pcr will have to be uh, become a part of our anybody who is doing rapid test antigen test uh, in place of uh, rt pcr so gold standard is rt pcr I, i don't think there is a substitute and uh, the, the, the confidence is not there even if your uh, you, you, the sensitivity specific issues are there in those now this is a question to test us you must be having lot of precautionary patients all of us have so what are the precautions you advise to them general precautions right so so for tracheostomy patients um, usually these patients you know they come to our clinic you know for regular tracheostomy care we give them the advice you know just to stay um way of trouble let's say uh it's it's that these patients you know they have their masks they have the filters placed uh, over the trachea cannulas um cancer patients are obviously you know they it's a different breed of these patients they they have a different mentality in many things and it's very hard to persuade this patient to do things unless they really realize the danger um and so most of them you know you have to tell them that they need to wear something to cover uh the uh, the the stoma one of these you know covers uh the moist uh, covers uh to prevent as we wear the masks uh there not been any studies to see whether these are actually effective or not honestly but the way that we have our mask our cloth masks you know pay, pay, uh, place in a piece of cloth or a gauze that is moist it may be just an alternative way to protect them now other patients that may be coming um from from uh uh hospices or from chronic care facilities these they do they do get tested over there so quite quite in a regular basis and so is also the uh, the ancillary staff uh and uh, the uh, uh the visitors the family visitors so so far you know managing these patients for tracheostomy management uh, we haven't had any issues um and before entering the hospital they have to get a proof that they have a covid test within for 72 hours before their appointment so this is a prerequisite for these patients a good thing to tell them is to have hme always wear hme filters especially if they are coming to hospitals uh, rather than keeping their uh, tubes open uh, and obviously a mask over that because the risk is more to the other patients and uh, it's it's a simple filter uh, which they should be advised to wear now we've already discussed the pre operative covid testing now uh, dr anand pre operative anesthesia considerations you also mentioned you mentioned slightly that you take slightly longer uh, but anything you like to add in specifically pre operative anesthesia considerations so my experience with patients coming in for laryngeal procedures per se not necessary voice surgery because though they somehow tend to be more fitter than the others but laryngeal procedures particularly with cancers you come across a lot of smokers you come across people with bad health who inevitably come with a lot of comorbidities and the thing is you have a patient who maybe has 50% 40% of them are particularly the older generation who's coming in form for a short period for a very intensive sympathetic stimulation so it becomes sometimes difficult to balance the two particularly when a patient who's really sick needs in deep general anesthesia to be able to tolerate the microlaryngeal surgery which would involve performing a laryngoscopy for the net duration of time that it does so it's challenging to try and balance the two and make sure that the patient wakes up at the end of it safe and sound the other thing that has been a bit disappointment particularly in the context of covid is that we used to do a lot of these cases with jet ventilation which is obviously now uh not the next suitable. question that is my next question we come to jet is, ventilation 
not suitable yeah. now and the recommendations currently for jet ventilation is to use it in a limited form with full covid precautions only when necessary and it becomes very really difficult for us to justify using that in a standard cold case particularly when it's it's really cleverly worded because i read the recent recommendations on jet and they say mm-hmm. only when there is an absolute emergency while on the other hand currently all the difficult airway rec- algorithms have excluded jet from them from their guidelines they're saying that if there is a problem with intubation you perform a tracheostomy or a tracheostomy and not use jet particularly because of evidence coming in from england where there has been a higher chance of pneumothorax and i think two patient deaths in in patients who were used you know a jet ventilator was used because the patient was unable to be intubated and they landed up with pneumothorax mm-hmm. i mean that had a during lot of covid time this is during this, covid time this, this, is, this is pre covid time so in 2018 the revised guidelines for difficult intubation management were brought out and they looked at the evidence over the past 5 years and they noticed that a lot of the operators of jet ventilation were actually not trained enough yeah so when those operators had to use a jet in an emergency they landed up with problems i think there were two mortalities which were actually traced directly to the jet rather than to difficult intubation so anyway they phased out jet to be used to not to be used for difficult intubation and now with covid they are saying use it in an emergency which is not going to be there with with us so it's that is the i would say the disappointing part that we were really enjoying using the jet and now we don't have it anymore we we had got jet about 3 years back and almost all our learning that work in pre covid time had shifted to jet unless there were difficult cases or there were contraindications so But as an an as an analyst yeah, yeah. that is the interesting thing i found is that the anesthesia i am now choosing for laryngeal surgery micro laryngeal surgery for airway surgery is the same anesthesia i once used to give when i was training years ago so we kind of regress back to a baseline because anyway it was safe but we thought we'd progress further but now with covid we have come back to use the old anesthetic techniques because they are more suitable in a covid era dinesh you are using jet or no no jet well we try to avoid using jet i should say this was a particular problem for us right because we need to laser we need to jet we need to do a lot of things so i would say at the beginning for airway stenosis we were just dilating and getting the patients out of there you know and subsequently we went to um uh, apnea technique if we needed to laser just a very quick laser try to avoid it uh i think we are slowly getting a little bit more comfortable again it depends on how comfortable we feel with the covid test if you feel very comfortable with that you could probably treat it as if it's a covid negative but i would say i agree i think uh, avoid the jet if possible for now now this jet we have already covered uh tesos uh, before pre covid times were you using jet or you were going to normal uh, anesthesia techniques uh mostly jet for all laryngological cases uh, i tend to do them with jet it's rarely that i use uh, uh a uh a tube a normal you know um uh, a small tube um and so we still now uh, we use jet and whenever i request we use jet you know we trust that the patient will be tested if the patient has also repeat asymptomatic for a week and has a negative test we treat them as 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 we were doing before the covid era um i think the only question with that is that there is even the rt pcr the there is a 30% chance of it being uh, being positive despite a negative rt pcr test it may have to do with the type of kit the the, the credibility of the kit but till now literature says it's about 30% unless some other figures come up in recent times and then we can be more confident uh now amitabh during your laryngeal surgery any safety tips for the audience when you are doing surgery things which are different from normally what you were doing in the pre covid era obviously uh, the anesthetist has mentioned those things once we take over from the anesthetist uh, the first thing we take over uh, and when we scope first and when we use the microscope the two questions are there if we have access to video laryngoscope and microscope whether we use video laryngoscope or microscope initial cases we found lot of struggles with goggles and adjusting the microscope and a face shield 
So we found the video laryngoscope was a better option where you can operate off the monitor if you are not using laser. So that is one tip that you can try. I mean, this is, we have tried that in the initial uh, cases. The second thing is that if you have to use a microscope or whether you not use a microscope, you we cover the entire area right from the microscope to the bed like a hood and that i think most of us are doing that at least in uh, india and once you cover that you tend to minimize the aerosol generation and make two holes through that hood and then try to operate your two hands if you are using laser in addition to the normal laser suction through the tube we also have a small additional suction uh, just in the uh, vicinity of the laryngoscope, which would then uh, exclude any other additional fumes going into the system. So these are the few things that we would do. And obviously, I would never work with a new anesthetist in this COVID era because I do not want to patient get suddenly, you know, to a lighter plane and then start, you know, moving or coughing, whatever. That is a very important issue because if you're if it's not your routine anesthetist they will not be able to give you like dr anand said a very deep plane of anesthesia as you do the surgery um, and those are the things and depending on whether you use laser or not that that's your personal thing but then we take all those precautions that you minimize the aerosol uh, only uh, is that uh, normally with your video laryngoscope you are not able to use the laser because the yeah, mechanism okay. is such, the slot is such that you are not able to okay. uh, work uh, with the video laryngoscope. But even if you are using the microscope, what you said, there should be a separation, probably a sheet or a shield which separates. Second thing is preferably you try to operate on the monitor. Instead of looking yeah. through, the, uh, through the microscope, you try to operate on the monitor with the goggles. Because wearing goggles or a face shield and then looking through the microscope is difficult. And most of us, we tend to take it out because we, we don't see and we want to see better, we take it out. But if you're operating on the monitor, then uh, probably it's safe. That is one thing. Uh, Dinesh, you like to add something on the some safety tips during surgery? I would just add that I think over time, as you uh, look at your institution and your COVID testing, how comfortable you feel with that, you'll get more and more comfortable doing the surgery as we did. I think we're pretty much back to how we used to do it. Um, of course, we're all wearing the N95 doing cases. That's, that's changed. And we wear a face shield and we minimize the procedure time. So my advice would be, you know, do it as quickly as you can. Cut down the time also. Obviously, the exposure is related to the time. Now, type of PP, what uh, Dinesh was referring to, that's also any comment on the type of PP during laryngeal surgery? So again, it depends on the pathology. I mean, I, I now we initially we were all using double masks, uh, one N95 or KN95 and over the, and, and another, you know, normal surgical mask over it. You know, gradually as we evolve and now we do more cases and we, having audited and seeing that there has not been any incident for more than one month, then we treat them as we used to do before the COVID era. So if you have, for example, a Yoma case, I always wear an N95 mask. I always try to wear an N95 mask and tell all the personnel to wear when we have a jet vent uh, case. But in all the other ENT cases that we made too, uh, we wear normal surgical masks. I've noticed that some of the, um, of the uh, uh, medical staff and ancillary staff that may work in double masks, but this is not really something that is a by protocol by rather than personal preference. Now, uh, your N95 masks, let me ask, this is, uh, are they single use or you are uh, reusing them? So, for a certain so uh, is it for me the question? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. So, so initially, in, when we were on the active COVID era, we were we were reusing them. So we were sterilizing them and we're using them for five times. Um, we also had, you know, the original 3M masks, um, and but we soon ran out of that. And then we have this single-use KN95 mask, uh, which is very uncomfortable, I would say. Um, and these are single-use. Dinesh, US, the single use and 95. 
at the beginning, you know, we didn't have these N95 masks, so we needed to recycle them. Like Tasso said, up to five times, and we had a special, you would take your mask off and put it in the UV section, and they would uh, ultraviolet light yeah. the thing, and then you use it again. Um, now we're getting to a point where we don't need to do that. Um, in fact, the, you could probably just use, if you have a COVID negative patient, you could probably use a regular surgical mask. However, I have not been ready to give up my N95 yet, so I'm still using it. So uh, here also, we are all using N95 masks, but they are being recycled. Uh, at an average in the hospital, in my team, uh, doctors, nurses, or even technicians, they get one mask per week. And it is uh, recycled maybe five to six times. And after a week, another mask is uh, got. Some of them, they use it one day, again, uh, use the other mask. But, 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 but it's not that, uh, you know, no, I think nobody, with so, so many uh, the, the amount of healthcare workers can have uh, see single use N95 masks. So we must uh, need to, and this is supported by literature. It can be reduced. Now, in non-COVID patients, tracheostomy. Uh, Gautam, do you have done any tracheostomies? Uh, we had very few tracheostomies, uh, luckily. But even in non-COVID patients, we haven't taken any risk. Like uh, uh, the tracheost two tracheostomies that we had to do, we had done under GA. Patient intubated, basically, and uh, we take all the necessary precautions. I mean, uh, to the last questions that you uh, discussion that uh, that had happened. Since, as I said, we are our OTs are not that. Uh, I mean, having not, uh, we do not have negative pressure OTs, etc. We are still wearing, even if the patient is COVID negative proved, we still wear a PPE. We still wear the shield mask. We wear double mask, in fact, over the. N95, we wear another surgical mask and we wear the shield. We take all the precautions because uh, we don't want to take chances. As far as tricostomy is concerned, yes, a couple of tricostomies that we have done has been under uh, with the patient intubated. And uh, basically the guideline is we, once we make the track, the tube is pushed in and uh, we uh, we keep our tracheostomy tube ready and it is a coordinated effort when the endotracheal tube is withdrawn, we put in the tracheostomy tube at the same time to prevent the aerosol generation. Now, anybody from the panel can take this question, local or GA, where there is a choice, tracheostomy under local or general anesthesia, which is preferable? I would always do it under general. General anesthesia. Dinesh? Yes. General or local? General. 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 So, though the process may be more, but the surgical part, probably the, the, the aerosol generation will be less during that part. Yes. Pre anesthesia, post anesthesia, but again, adequate precautions are taken. But during surgery, the aerosol generation will be less during the general anesthesia. But again, uh, some local trichosmies are unavoidable. Malignancy coming in. In emergency strider, last month we've had uh, at least three or four cases in this situation. Uh, laryngotracheal trauma with strider, you, you have to do under local anesthesia. Now, COVID positive patients. Anybody who's done a tracheostomy in a COVID positive patient in the panel? No. Right. One and thing to remember, if I may, yeah. Kamut, is I yeah, yeah. had to do a, it was actually an interesting case. The patient had been COVID positive and then, uh, you know, we wait. We don't, we wait two weeks and there's a lot of evidence now that after 10 or 14 days, you may still get a positive test, um, but they may not be infectious. So something to think about. And so this particular patient that I had done a, a, a trach on was uh, about 20 days out had tested negative, and so I said, okay, let's do it. And then on the day of the trach, which was two days later, the test came back positive. <laughs> now what, right? But I think the answer is you have to treat them as if they are, you know, we're still in the me mental state that they are COVID positive, even if, even if there's this argument now that after 14 days, 21 days, they may not be infectious anymore. Yeah, we have to treat them as COVID positive. And in these patients, I think the test should be done. 
just giving a gap doesn't necessarily ensure. And uh, in uh, ICUs, probably it's it, the, the sensible thing is let them be intubated. Uh, tricosmy should be avoided as far as possible, unless it is absolutely necessary. And if it is yes, to be done. Is, sorry, my question is, if, let's say they've been a month after their first COVID test and they're still testing positive, right? How would you make that decision then for a tracheostomy? It depends on the indication. Suppose it is very central, then I'll go ahead and do this. So may I just, you know, add something to it? Uh, because I was involved in, in these exact questions when, you know, we are, during my pass in the unit, because there were many patients that we had been uh, called to do tracheostomies that we were trying to see how would be the optimal, and when would be the optimal time to operate on them. So we looked in, in the literature and, and there have been some guidelines in some countries like in the UK, there have been many studies trying to determine the same and answer the same question. Um, and, and from what I, uh, I understood is that the protocols that, that they have come up with was basically uh, relate, uh, related to what would be the prognosis of that patient. If that patient had a dismal prognosis, even a month out, with so many other comorbidities that have been active, there would be no point to do a tracheostomy in a patient that would not have any, anywhere to go. On the contrary, if a patient had some good prognosis and had been then called for tracheostomy, then again, it should be delayed, but usually the decision would be around two weeks post-intubation, two, two to three weeks post-intubation to take the decision and decide what would be the condition at that time. So early tracheostomy was avoided, as would usually is the normal on patients that we are called in the ICU that may be having a potential not to recover and we were called, we were called to do tracheostomies earlier. In this particular patients, it's all determined on if the patients will, will turn around the corner at some point or if they have been having multi-organ failures so there's not any way that they can come around and then there's no point, you know, risking ourselves or ancillary staff or medical staff to do a tracheostomy in these patients. So that was very, the decisions that we have mutually agreed upon. Very right. This is the flux. If it depends on the prognosis, if it's going to recover, uh, we do. Let me muddy the waters further from the intensive care perspective, because as uh, anesthetists, we also look at the ICU patients. The, uh, in our hospital, a lot of hospitals, because the ventilator beds are actually in short supply, quite often, I mean, this has been going on even in the pre-COVID areas that patients who were sicker, who were likely to stay uh, in the ICU for longer, who, were who actually had a long course, were often tracheostomized early so that they could be stepped down. Because intubation, they need sedation. They need more looking after than someone who's had a tracheostomy who can be managed with an HME filter and a basic oxygen with lesser attention than before. So even with the COVID area, I think there have been instances where a patient has been tracheostomized or pushed early for tracheostomy so that even with a graver prognosis, particularly those with comorbidities, so that his ventilator is freed and he can be stepped down to another center where to another room where he's isolated, but then he can be um, looked after with lesser resources and the ventilator goes to someone who's actually likely to make a better prognosis out of it. And this, yeah, yeah, please. Particularly in uh, neurology with neurological injuries, those with hypoxia, prolonged hypoxia, COVID positive, they're on the ventilator. They're not going to come out of it. Uh, basically, they're on they're on the ventilator because they're intubated. If you can get that tube out, and the simplest thing to get the, uh, to do that is replace the tube with a tracheostomy, then they could be nursed in an isolated area of the hospital, and that ventilator can be freed for someone who really needs it. Where resources are scarce, this is very, very pertinent that you have to uh, do a track to get them out of the ICU and the ventilator and the cost also. The cost of ICU stay where insurance is not there, which is up, uh, in private hospitals in India. The one thing I'm very scared of is my patients staying in ICU for very long, even post-surgery because the cost uh, goes up. So the, what Dr. Alan said is very, very relevant. Especially, now, in the, especially in our context in India where the level of family support is high. So it's already a tradition that if a patient is unlikely to get out of the ventilator long weaning time, with an old age and existing comorbidities, they're actually tricosmized and sent given back to the family who will look after them. Yes. Now the second question is uh, Amitabh. 
if he is in icu percutaneous tracheostomy or open tracheostomy i would uh, advise an open tracheostomy because with an open tracheostomy you a uh, as we said uh, oh you mean in in the icu setup covid covid patient if you have COVID a covid patient in icu yeah. setup percutaneous tracheostomy or open tracheostomy i mean if there is a if there is a team in the icu who has been doing thousands of percutaneous tracheostomy and who can do it very efficiently then probably i would prefer them to do it because it's the operating Surgically, time which is non covid there is no difference it is not a difference operate surgically a different situation there is your comments percutaneous or open tracheostomy if you were as the choice oh. in a covid positive percutaneous but i was going to make a quick comment and say as ent surgeons we've been very loath to do tracheostomy and then the pulmonologist and icu doctors always want us to do the trick so it's going to be this push pull for for you know going forwards and i think you kind of have to make a, a institutional plan as to how to do it and i think what tasa said what is exactly right but it, of course if i i think there is uh, it's perfectly safe to do it uh, percutaneously and our pulmonologists are actually very happy to do it yeah but my question was related to the risk of uh, say aerosol gener uh, generation or infection uh, which is safe you have, you have similar issues you know like the strike i was doing uh, we talked about how you're supposed to push the tube down and and uh, and then you can do it under general and open but sometimes what happens is it doesn't work out exactly the same way after i made the tracheotomy there was a huge leak of air and there was a bunch of air that just blew all into the room so you 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 really have to think about how you know that's a time when you can make aerosol so i i think i think the key to this all is ppes and wearing an n95 or papper and 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 just that is the best way to protect ourselves but either way is okay i think um i i think there yes. have been also some some studies that describe what would be the proper way to do a tracheostomy in covid patients you know just to avoid to have the aerosolization to close the ventilator when you do the incision you know to forward and inflate without uh, any any aerosolization the same with the percutaneous ways that there have been some other you know um uh, ways to do a percutaneous by placing uh and uh, a and, and mini uh, tube to inflate distantly close to the carina and then you're doing the percutaneous while you ventilate the patient with a, with a mini um, catheter. So there have been many ways described how to, to fight that. You know, then it depends on expertise, depends, you know, again, on good communication with, uh, with anesthesiologists that did test us to do this. I think the other take in this is that a percutaneous tracheostomy done by the pulmonologist or the intensivist at bedside in a negative pressure room is less likely to expose the rest of the hospital compared to a surgical tracheostomy in the OT where even if it's a COVID generate uh, specific OT, then you actually will be moving the patient from the ICU across the hospital corridors, however designated they might be. And there's a, definitely a risk of virus spread. So there's a lot of transaction. There's a lot of handover going on. And in our place, there are the intensivists who are comfortable with percutaneous tracheostomy prefer to do their COVIDs within the room in a negative pressure center setting. And the ones that in, aren't in, will send it across to us. Uh, I mean, in, in, in tracheostomy, uh, as such, you know, when we uh, think about tracheostomy, it is not uh, at that particular time whether the patient is COVID positive or, or not is not going to make a you know, big difference because. The, uh, and the patient who is going to be tracheostomized is going to be there in the hospital aerosol generating person and we have to think him as an aerosol pro, uh, generating person you know not uh, just the procedure alone because he's going to go home and uh, generate uh, uh, aerosol and uh, that will be you know um, um, uh, infecting uh, um, family members and the community and how long it's going to be there with the tracheostomy and how long he's going to come back to the uh, hospital uh, for uh, repeat uh, uh, procedures and uh, those things are very important to uh, uh, decide to do whether uh, going ahead with the tracheostomy or uh, not. So tracheostomy as much as possible if we are able to uh, avoid or prolong then, then that's possible 
then maybe you can go ahead with that or in case if you are doing tracheostomy then there is a situation now what happens people are living with tracheostomy not able to seek uh, uh, any professional uh, help uh, because of the transport system and all the other issues people are living with tracheostomy for no reason for many uh, months uh, now so um, as much as possible we should uh, be able to decanulate that person and making him a non aerosol generating person that will be useful for the community so that so, that's so a very, very relevant point the message should go that not uh, let's not take the easy way that if somebody is tricosmy is tricosmy let him stay with the tricosmy wherever it is possible uh, we assess if he's a fit candidate for decanulation if he re requires a small procedure maybe we can delay the longer resections and uh, ltrs and pctrs for but where it is smaller procedures it just means doing a fire flexible fiber optic and x ray soft tissue neck to see if he is a candidate we should decanulate there is no point because if you keep him tricosmyes uh, he is probably a bigger risk that way if he is covid positive now just one question our time is running out uh, how many of you have taken chemo prophylaxis hqs no one so i think uh, there is a lot of sorry dr sharma has raised his hand i have i have acha no, dr anand has raised his hand so it's only one out of six who has taken uh, hqs now there is there is a lot of ideas on whether to take hqs in uh, high risk healthcare workers or not our hospital supplied this medicine to each and every one option was left to them whether you want to take or not it supplied provided they wanted it uh, but again it is debatable whether we uh, high risk uh, healthcare worker should take hqs or not uh, as a drug alone probably it's safe but if you are combining with say azithral course there have been incidents uh, what is the how much Uh, authenticity that it was the combination of uh, azithral and hqs which caused those heart events or there have been one or two sudden deaths we don't know but again it is left to the individual whether to take chemo prophylaxis or not now telemedicine the last question asos how much of your practice has shifted to telemedicine so uh, our specialty you know is, is is you examining through holes so you know for us as ENTs unless you're a head and neck surgeon that you can see something visually on the neck or something that someone can stick out his tongue and see the mouth uh, telemedicine has no really that much of use other than keeping in touch with the patients um, and just uh, telling them that you're there for them uh, and just keeping them you know in the loop and that's how we we started implementing a digital encounters in the covid era just to you know to keep the patients uh, keeping in touch with the patients you know see little bit of problems and arrange follow up appointments based on what the problem may be and obviously you know based on their 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 history we will be able to screen these patients and see if some of them had something that would be rendered as urgent so that we can bring in the main uh, no matter what the precautions might have been taken um now that we are a full there are some patients that may be in a distance that may not be uh you know easy to come one or two because now uh, there is a compulsory check on the borders of the emirates so to reach abu dhabi anyone that comes from another emirate has to be tested with a pcr and one it's costly secondly you know it, it's something that if you call a patient for a follow up that patient has to be you know have the pcr in the, a swab test done all the time so they don't want that so we keep some slots that are for telemedicine just to you know to see and get feedback from the patients but this have been very limited now so so in a nutshell yes uh, because there is a lot of scare among patients who come to hospital that is also true so having an initial encounter just getting the feel of the problem but there is no escaping from actually seeing the laryngeal lesion this is not like nasal cases exactly this is probably not like ear cases also exactly maybe with the whether it's a false smelling discharge you get hint whether this is unsafe safe or but laryngology you need to see you need to see so after the first encounter you must call them but you can buy out time if you don't suspect it is malignant 
No, I mean, before uh, speech pathologists are doing a video a video encounters, and particularly for these patients that come for speech pathology, you know, in order to have a, a a full assessment that you need to take off your mask and you know do techniques with them, it will be very difficult to do them wearing masks. So there's a true value in this in digital encounters by sitting in the computer, the distally, and then doing uh, the speech pathology and voice therapy exercises without you know again being covered. Yes. So the, the, our voice therapist is also doing that. Yes. Uh, now, before we end, uh, there are some audience questions which we will take, which are not repeated. I can't take all of them. There are a lot of questions which have come in. Uh, but something which has not been uh, covered. Uh, one question is, do we need to change PP kit after every positive case? Dr. Amitabh, somebody is operating a positive case. Do you need to change PP kit after every case? I think yes, in my opinion. Yeah, I think so. Everybody is, uh, you, are, you are risk scrubbing. Even in a non-positive case, we are not, in OPD setup is different. If you, you may wear the same uh, mask and gown and see your OPD patients and do your, after doing uh, alcohol uh, and uh, rub sanitization. But in OT, you have to change after every patient. The second question is by Dr. Swagat Khanna from Guwahati. Concept of negative pressure OT, and is it easy to convert your OT to negative pressure? Dr. Anand, can you take this question? Yes, Concept sir. of negative, how do you convert your normal OT to negative pressure OT? So we have two options. If there is a centralized air conditioning, because see, we have negative pressure rooms in the ward and in the intensive care at our hospital, but the, none of the OTs were essentially negative pressure. So mm -hmm. the, the thing, particularly with OT Dynamics, I, I think worldwide there has been when OTs were designed, the concept of negative pressure was not there because people were not looking at performing an infected case, something like that. So the concept was of air changes. The more frequent air changes you have, the less likely you're actually going to be spreading the infection. So currently what we do, our COVID OT has around 16 air changes when it's activated, which means you need to start the OTs. Uh, you need to tell the AC plant managers an hour before the COVID case goes in, they start their 16 air changes. Then it kind of becomes negative pressure because it's, it's taking more air out of the OT and every time you open the door, you can actually feel it. The second thing is, uh, even if you have a high flow laminar system, like the orthopedic OTs, then it's reasonable because what you want to do is provide a high turnover so that the virus gets out and does not infect the rest of the streams. Now, interestingly, within India, because a lot of these features are not available, particularly in the peripheral centers, so the Indian Society of Anesthetists come, has come up with a local solution that you uh, have a well-ventilated OT. You, often these OTs will have window ACs. There are not going to be central air conditioning. So well-ventilated OTs with more than one exhaust fan running continuously. So what it, that is going to do is actually push in all the air outside. Now, obviously it means that the virus inside is going to go outside. But generally, this is supposed to be in an ideal world, this would go along with the scavenging system, but basically going out of the atmosphere. So what this is going to do is create an air current from within the OT to outside. So more than one exhaust fan, typically two or three, sited close to the window air conditioning. Or if you have central AC, then try and use a laminar flow theater, or you use at least 16th air changes uh, set up with the AC plant. For a standard OT where there are six to 12 air changes, it becomes safe to use after half an hour. With 16 air changes, it becomes safe to use after five minutes. So he has described course, all three things. Yeah, and of course, HEPA filters. Right. He has described all three situations, simply air condition or where there is nothing. So what minimum you can do to uh, be more safe. Now there is another question on from Dr. Dr. Chinnappam, apart from COVID tests, any other tests for GA cases like CT lung? Dr. Amitabh, any case we, where you... Uh, uh, we are doing that practice. Our practice in our hospital has been a COVID test seven days before the... Seven or five days before the... Uh, which is RT-PCR, before the planned surgery. And because the patient goes home, patient comes and gets admitted, we do a repeat COVID test second, I mean, on the day of the admission. Next day we operate, we also do a 
It's just CT screening. These are the three things that we are doing. For you are our, doing uh, just CT screening for all the operations? Yes. Uh, Anyone else in the panel who's doing a CT screening for pre-op, not for... Just, just, just a quick screening system. Yours is a very rich, resourceful hospital. I don't think any of us is doing a screening CT for pre-operative operative normal patients. We are doing for uh, hospital as protocols for COVID patients who come in uh, such oxygen saturation and CT, they have their own criteria, but for pre-operatively, uh, we are not doing. There is a question asked in this regard also. And uh, because the, you may have but your argument can be there are 30% patients whose uh, RT-PCR may be negative when actually it is positive. So you are doing a chest screening. But most of us will not do that just for logistics. Now there is another question. Do you have any, have your anesthetists with you during office-based surgical procedures? Dr. Tassos? So in office procedures, you know, um, as I, as I mentioned earlier, we have the, uh, the privilege of having converted the, um, the uh, procedure room to a negative pressure room. Nevertheless, I always you know, wear the PPEs about my ancillary staff and I protect myself as if the patient was a COVID positive. I don't think anybody in OPD will have the luxury of having anesthetists and uh, nor is it required also. Uh, your question may be for sedation, but we hardly give sedation. And even for flexible like, office based, nobody gives sedation for office based procedures. No. We just do no. local anesthesia sprays. And uh, Dinesh, uh, you also? Uh, you, yeah, you're not doing sedation. Yeah. So you don't need anesthetist. There is another question from Dr. Munka from Bukaro. Many times after biopsy from vocal cord, voice takes long to recover. Because of sulci or scar, what should be the approach? I'll answer that. Don't take a very deep biopsy because, unless the lesion merits so, but uh, if you go medial to the vocal ligament, and uh, then the, the, these issues come up of scar forming after a biopsy, because a representative piece should be uh, taken unnecessarily deep. If if you have a biopsy negative, then you need to take a deep biopsy. But in the first go to cut off a good piece of the chunk of the vocal cord, uh, especially where voice is a concern, maybe not advisable. Then there is a question, what do you mean by preservation of professional voice and applicable? Is it applicable to all and not only singers and performers? So his question is, when we use the word professional voice, is it only for singers and presentational people or it can be to others also? Yeah, it, it's a good question. It can be to others also. Anybody who is using his voice for a living, it may be a teacher, it may be a hawk street hawker. So they are all professional voice users. So during a talk, we just confine to singers and uh, presentational people, but it, it can uh, and encompass everybody, and everybody's voice is important. You uh, there is a city in India called Kota. It is a hub of uh, educational institutions. People who go in medical colleges or IITs, they, they, they stay there and they only study. They don't give their board exams at all or give it only a... I, every month I get three to four teachers from there. They are teaching 12 to 14 hours. And they have laryngeal lesions. They have... Uh, so they, they are also professional voice users, tutors. It, 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 it is very, very lucrative uh, business today and they, they, they overuse, misuse their voice. So th this definitely comes in professional voice users. Any final comment by the panelists before we wind it up? Anybody would like to say something which has not been covered in the last two hours? If not, then we'll call it a day. I think end of this has been a very, very fruitful and useful deliberation. Uh, the message probably is we, we are back to work. We have to work with due precautions, guidelines. Yes, laryngology needs more care than other specialties, but it is not something that we shut down our 
opd places our theaters and uh, we we have to get back to our work and i thank uh, dr dinesh dr tasos dr thiru dr amitabh roy choudhary dr gautam dr anil sharma uh, dr vijay for doing the speed work uh, dr mohan for the initial introduction indian academy for making this happen and our sponsors and i hope they will uh, for the benefit of people who are not joined in they can put uh, a recorded version on youtube send all of us a link and we'll spread it across sure, sir. Thank, thank you, you very much thank, thank you, you very much. much thank you very much it was a pleasure thank you thank you, thank you.